Well, tonight I'm going to do something completely different. I hope you're all right with that. I don't want to preach tonight. Oh, yeah, let's do something different. Instead of the, we're tired of that stuff you're always doing, Pastor. No, I'm teasing. We're going to do something a little different tonight. Tonight, we are going to, you, whether you know it or not tonight, we are in class. Amen? So, and the reason I'm doing this, Thunder in the Bass coming and some of the greatest preachers you've, you'll ever hear, because some of them are going to be first timers here, Dr. Jazz Sensei, I, you've probably never heard, she's a little, little petite little thing, and I think she's from Trinidad and uh, raised in New York City from about the age of seven and horrible testimony, and I was at Michael Pitts' church in Toledo last uh, October, and uh, she was the speaker that night, never heard of her. She tore the place up. It was unbelievable. Did a teaching on Elizabeth and who hid for six months her pregnancy and and uh, no more hiding what the what you're carrying with it, it was just unbelievable. So I highly recommend that night. I don't know what I don't know what the lineup is, but that night come on out. Ron Carpenter, a great preacher. He's never preached in California before. He's so excited. So um, and uh, the whole lineup, the Zamoras, who you may have got to know when Michael was here in June. We'll be doing day sessions and uh, doing the prophetic. So it's going to be a very different conference, but it's going to be good. Amen? Well, tonight you are in class, okay? And I used to teach the Bible history class in our Bible college for a number of years. And I was going through some old notes, and I came across this. And I think it's very apropos. And I want to talk to you about the 12 who changed the world. Normally, this is our Bible study night and really, I only have one scripture, and my scripture, I believe, is from the book of Matthew. And when he, capital H, Jesus, had called his 12 disciples to him. Interesting. The synoptic gospels always call them disciples. The gospel of John calls his 12 disciples slash apostle. He interchanges the terms. But the terms are very different. Jesus says, go into all the world and make disciples, not apostles, all right? So obviously, you, before you can become an apostle, you must become first what? A disciple. And you can see the word discipline or is, in, is the base of the word disciple. He calls these who are going to be close to him. Notice they're not called converts. Jesus never did an altar call because there was really nothing to convert to. As of yet, the religion had not been formed. Okay. Is my class awake tonight? Yeah. Okay. And no gum chewing in my class. I'm going to tell you right now. No, I'm just... <laughs> He gave them, look at this. If you become a disciple of Jesus, you, you receive some things. Can I get an amen on that? Oh, we're in class. That's right. No, I forgot. He gave them power over unclean spirits to cast the unclean spirits out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease, verse two. Now, here are the names of the 12, look at this, apostles, right? First verse, he called them disciples. No, he's calling them apostles. The first of these is Simon, who got a name change to Peter, his brother Andrew, James, the son of Zebedee, all right? Anybody know what Zebedee stands for? If you, if you know, put your hand up. We're in class. <laughs> Anybody know what Zebedee stands for? I can't, it's hard for me to see. No? How about in the, up in the, bow, in the bleachers? No, the ble All right. Over here. Well, let me start right here. I, I know your names, but I want the class to know. Young man right here, stand up, state your name. Cass. Cass. What is uh, Zebedee? Thunder. Thunder. Very good. And because Cass knew that, Cass, you get some M&Ms. All right. Zebedee means thunder. And John, obviously, his brother. So hence, we get the term the sons of thunder, right? James and John, right? Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the tax collector. We're reading his book. More on that in a minute. Another James. It was two James. This one is history calls James the Less or the James, the son of Alphaeus. I don't know if I was this James, I would prefer the son of Alphaeus than being called James the Less. But anyway. And 
Lebeus, more on that, whose real name was Thaddeus, all right? Gospel of John, he has another name, but more on that in a minute. Another Simon, remember there's Simon, whose name got changed to Peter. So we have two James, we have two Simons, and he was a Canaanite, or right? And Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These 12 would become the closest followers of Jesus for over a three-year period. But once Jesus left the scene, these 12 would become the primary teachers of the gospel of Jesus. Tonight, I'm going to talk about all 12. Now, I can't spend a lot of time on all 12. If I did 10 minutes on all 12, that's 120 minutes, and you guys would be bailing on me and the spaghetti would get cold, right? So we don't want to do that. If I did five minutes on all 12, all right, anybody good with math? How long would that be? Oh, you didn't raise your hand, so you don't get a candy. I'm sorry. That'd be 60 minutes, and I don't, so I'm going to spend about three minutes. I think I can do it, okay, on each one. Before we get started, I want you to know that what are my sources of what I'm teaching you tonight? Um, My sources will be first century writer named Clement, a second century writer named Iranius, a third century writer named Augustine, and Tertullian, a man named that history calls Eusebius, and my last one is a first century writer who was alive when these guys were alive, and his name was Polycarp. Okay, so these are my sources that I'm going to use because we're going to talk about the time when the Bible ends and the apostles were still alive, All right? This is what history calls the apostolic age, okay? This would be the time when the gospels were written. The gospels were not written during Jesus' time. They'd be written 30 to 40 years, in one case, maybe 60 years after he was gone, Okay? This was obviously the time when the epistles, the letters of Paul, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, right? 1st, 2nd Timothy, Jude, you could even throw Hebrews in there. This would be the time when Hebrews would be, the, the epistles were written. And some even say when the Apostles' Creed was formed. So before we get started, I'm also going to use a lot of art. And I do this for a reason. Uh, a lot of Renaissance art and a lot of Greek icons and a lot of sculpture from the Renaissance period. And why do I pick the, this art to show you? Because this art to me has, is important. When we went to Greece a number of years ago, we had a guy named Valena. And I took 80 of my, follow, uh, my church in Jubilee Tri-Valley out in Livermore, and we went and did the Greece trip. And she would keep showing us specific icons. And I'll show you what icons are. They're two-dimensional pictures that are revered by the Orthodox Church. And a few of my folks on my bus said, isn't that kind of paganism or isn't, because they're praying to the icons and this and that. And she said something that still resonates with me to this day. She says, you don't realize that we were under the Ottomans control for 400 years. The Ottomans were Muslims from Turkey. And it was illegal to have a Bible. You could be imprisoned, even you could be killed for having possession of a Bible. But the, but the Ottomans would allow us to put these pictures on the wall. So how else could you tell your children about the story of Jesus or of the saints or of the disciples or of the miracles? You could point to these pictures on your walls. And this, in essence, became our Bible. During the Renaissance, the only Bibles that you could have in possession would be written in Latin, which was a long-lost language of the Romans. Right? You could argue the church wanted it that way because they didn't want you to be able to read the Bible you would have to take their interpretation of it because you couldn't look at it yourself. So what would they do? They would look towards the art and the masters and the paintings, and this was how they would learn the stories of the Bible. You following me? So first up is to show all 12 together. I just gave you all their names. One of the most famous pieces of art. Who is not familiar with Da Vinci's Last Supper? All right. Can anybody tell me where this, oh, too late. It's like Jeopardy, you didn't form it in the form of a question. It is in, you're right, brother. It is in Milan, Italy. It is uh, actually not a painting. It is a fresco. It is on the walls of a cave or a grotto 
in Milan, so it can never be moved. You'd have to move the whole cave or remove that wall. Are you following me? And uh, they used to allow tourists to go look at it, and they've really uh, slowed that down, like to one or two days, because they're saying your breath or your the, the sweat from your pores is fading the paint, and so only one day a week. Now I think you can go literally look at it. So they don't want me breathing on it or sweating around it, I guess. So uh, a lot of symbolism with da Vinci's painting. Notice no cup on the table. That's kind of odd for a Last Supper painting, right? You can see, and of course, with the da Vinci Code and all that that was in the news about 10 years ago, that I truly do believe that da Vinci was trying to say something with this painting. A lot of people believe that the figure to his right, that history attributes to be the disciple John, uh, in the Da Vinci Code, it's who? Mary Magdalene, right? It does look very feminine. Some even say you can see the outline of breasts. I don't know. My point is this. I do believe Da Vinci was trying to tell us something in this painting. What was he trying to tell us? Perhaps his own wacky little thoughts, right? He was mad at the church, and the church had commissioned him. He was much more of a scientist than a painter, but the church had pretty much commissioned him, you are going to paint for the Vatican and under this Pope's control, and I don't think he liked it. So he tried to put a lot of symbolism into his paintings, right? Is it true? That was, is that really Mary Magdalene? Was she carrying the, the child of Christ? He has no proof whatsoever on that theory, nor has any valid proof ever been surmised or even shown. Did he believe that? I personally do believe he did think that, but he had no proof. You following me? But one of the most famous paintings of the 12. I always wondered who took the picture. Must have been the busboy. But anyway, <laughs> so let me start with our 12 before I lose you tonight. No particular order. I know in the Bible when names are listed, it's always the most important all the way down. Not me. I kind of just whatever came out, came out. But I did pick this one first because, one, let's get him out of the way. Our disciple number one tonight of course, is the man on the left kissing Jesus, and that is, anybody want to t take, uh, hands, 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 young man right here with the glasses on, state your name, James, who is that? No, 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 let's go to the bleachers, I can't see, in the young man, number 20, state your name, very good. You get a, let's see what you get, young man. You get a Reese's peanut butter cup. Being a Raider fan, I should have brought some, you a big slice of humble pie, but I didn't, so. Good job. That is Judas Iscariot, the betrayer of Jesus, right? This is a famous second, uh, actually, uh, Where's my artwork paper here? I'm going to mess all this up if I, if I get it wrong. This is a painting that sits in a church in Rome. They believe one of the earliest paintings of Judas. It's been retouched up. Do we have another picture? All right, and of course, what do we know about Judas? We, don't, we can stay in the Bible and hear his demise. The book of Acts pretty much tells us that he went to an area called the potter's field that he had purchased with the money that he had gotten from betraying Jesus, which is odd because the gospel seemed to be in unison that he went back and threw the money back at their feet. How did, did he go back and pick it all up and go by this field? I don't know. To me, the story doesn't make a lot of sense. I think Judas is a very sympathetic character in the Bible. I did a sermon a few good Fridays back, and uh, my dad had me do it. He really likes it. And I said that... Uh, I think Judas needed to stick around a little bit longer because I do believe Jesus would have forgave him. The Bible says one of them was going to betray him. It was going to happen. It was gonna be one of the 12. And you remember the great discourse, is it me, is it me, is it me, Lord? And then he even kind of whispers to one of them, says the man who dips into the vinegars will be the one who, who betrays me. And right then, Judas took the vinegar. If you read the synoptic gospels about his life, they give you no indication that when I say synoptics, though, that synoptic means seen together. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They tell the same story in the same order of events, pretty much the same miracles. When you read the red that Jesus speaks, it's almost identical, all right? So if you read those, Really, when it's betrayed as Judas is the betrayer, you're to be shocked. You can't believe it. 
Gospel of John, on the other hand, every time John mentions Judas, it always says, because he was a liar, because he was a thief and Satan had entered his heart. And the wickedness, I mean, the whole way through, there's gonna be no surprise in the Gospel of John who the betrayer is, okay? Um, but he hung himself in an area that today, I think we have another picture. This is the field. The Bible says that no man will ever buy or put anything on that field even to this day. Interesting, 2,000 years later, that's the field. That's a modern day picture of where Judas hung himself. It is called the field of blood. Interesting, and why am I showing you this? Because yesterday, me and my associate over here, my daughter Sonia, we booked Israel for next year. June 15th through the 24th, if you want to make little notes of that, and I will drive you right by that field. Every day that we're in Jerusalem, you can't avoid it. It's right in the Kidron Valley. You will drive right by this field, and you will get to see where Judas hung himself. Now, according to scriptures, his spot was taken in the book of Acts by another man. Anybody want to take a gander on who that is? I'll try this young man over here. State your name. Bob, Bob who was that? Thaddeus. I'm sorry? Thaddeus. Thaddeus? You're so close. <laughs> You're so close. I know it's James. Yes, sir. Matthias. That's who took his spot. And James, because uh, you got that right, I have, what do I have for you? Snickers bites. There you go. <laughs> got to share those, brother. So now disciple number two, okay? Believe we have a picture? Simon Peter. This is the very famous Peter Paul Rubens, the Dutch master painting of the fisherman Peter. What do we know about Peter? His real name was what? We already read that? Simon Shimon, right? Shimon or Simon in English literally means it's the names of the plants that surround the Sea of Galilee, okay? And it's kind of a tall reed. And when the winds blow, it looks like it's worshiping God. Okay? So it's kind of a beautiful name, Simon. Right? Um, but when Jesus posed the question, who do men say that I am? And they all kind of gave these bizarre answers. Uh, some say you're John the Baptist. Interesting answer, that because they were contemporaries, right? Um, others say you're Elijah. Some say you're one of the prophets. But Simon, this Simon, what did he answer? Oh, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, no longer shall your name be Shimon. Now your name will be what? In Greek, Petra or Peter, that's how we get the name Peter. One gospel gives the Aramaic term Cephas, which means stone, right? So his name gets changed to Rocky, or stone, right? What do we know about this man? He was a fisherman. He's one of the few that we learn about his past life. He's the only disciple or apostle that we know was married beyond a fact. Some surmise they all were. It would have been very common for a man in mid-20s to be married, but we know for beyond a shadow of a doubt that Peter was married because one of Jesus' first miracles is what? Healing his mother-in-law. Amen. He's obviously the man who thrice denied him. If you go with me to Israel next year, we will stand in that courtyard where the rooster crowed and Peter denied Jesus. He would also become the first Holy Ghost-inspired preacher in the book of Acts, right? In Acts chapter 2, it says the Spirit comes upon them and Peter stands up in the midst and gives a long discourse. You can read about that. But when the Bible ends, we, we, what else do we know about Peter? We see that really the book of Acts follows him up until about chapter 11. And we see Peter's already been traveling. Yet, it's Jesus who at the end of the Gospels tells Peter, you're going to run the show. It's called the primacy of Peter. Do you love me, Peter? Oh, you know I love you. Feed my sheep, right? You know, three times, feed my lambs, right? So obviously, the church is entrusted into Peter's care, and we see that in Acts chapter 3. Peter and John are going to prayer. Peter and John are making decisions. But by chapters 8, 9, 10, 11, 
Peter's no longer in Jerusalem. He's in Joppa. He's, he's healing Tabitha, whose, it says, surname was Dorcas. Again, there's a lot of names in the Bible that are interchangeable. But really, in the Old Testament, how many times does God change a name? You see a lot of name changes. So we see him healing this dead widow, right, named Tabitha, or you can call her Dorcas. I don't know. If it was me, I'd probably go with Tabitha than, uh, than Dorcas, but that's, call me crazy. That's what, I would, that's what I would do. But we see him traveling. All of a sudden, we see James, Jesus' brother, who's not one of the Jameses we're gonna talk about, running the Jerusalem church. Hmm. And the one time we see Peter and James, the dispute with Paul, Peter adheres to James's wisdom. Obviously, James, the brother of Jesus, is running the show. And the Bible is silent as to why. Did Peter feel inadequate? Did, feel, did Peter feel like he got usurped? Did Peter feel, we don't know. But one thing we do know, for the rest of Peter's life, he traveled. And we know, and we're gonna talk about this, in 67 AD, some 30 years, 35 years after the, the crucifixion and resurrection of our Lord, a major political thing happened we know this in, from numerous sources, and this is the great revolt, the Jewish revolt, where they attacked Rome. Rome had been running the Holy Land for a number of years, and insurrection and, and war breaks out. And history calls this event the Diaspora. If you were a Jew, and Christians at this time would still have been considered Jews, you were dispersed. You were either taken away as a slave, or you ran for your life before all hell broke loose, and you dispersed. And what is the significance of that? Well, in 1948, the Jews came back at the, after the end of World War II. And if you go with me to Israel, I'll show you numerous walls where there's numerous bullet holes still in them. And why are they important? Because a lot of the Israeli soldiers would drop their guns, even in gunfire coming, and went up to touch the Wailing Wall. Why? Because these would be the first Jewish hands since, six, since 70 AD that got to touch the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem because they, as a people, had been dispersed or the diaspora. Peter gets a jump on it and travels. And what else? What, we have another picture. In 65 AD, under Emperor Nero, in 64 AD, Rome burns. Seven boroughs of Rome burns. And it says, he did, what did Nero do while Rome was burning? Hands? Young lady, what's your name? Osa. Osa, what? He played the fiddle. Maybe the devil went down to Georgia. I don't know what he was playing on the fiddle. But he played the fiddle while Rome burned. And who did he blame, right? He blamed Christians. So young lady, I think I have, I'm running out of prizes here. You get Skittles. Amen. Taste the rainbow on those. In 65 AD, it says he crucified or lit on fire 2,000 Christians. So much so that the, their bodies would be dipped in tar and lit a fire, and that for two days, if you traveled to Rome at night, you could see everywhere you were going because so many Christians were burning. Peter was suffering the same fate as well, asked to be crucified, but at the last minute begs his captors do not crucify me in the same manner as my Lord because I'm unworthy. So they ask him, what do you mean? And he asked to be crucified upside down. What a horrible way to die. He would be martyred in 65 AD in the city of Rome. Today, his tombstone, would you like to take a gander at that? There is Peter's grave. That is St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. His body is literally buried underneath. Why? Because Catholics believe when Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church, they take it literally. They <laughs> built the, their church on top of old Rocky and his bones. In November 13th, 2013, our current Pope, Pope Francis I, allowed the media for the first time ever to view Peter's remains. There was nine large bone fragments that were shown that did carbon dating, did come out to be the first century, roughly the same time. And the significance of the bones were, 
They were missing their feet. Why would this give validation to the story that I just told you? Because once Peter was dead upon the cross, how would the Romans gotten his body off of there? Because they had more people to crucify. They would have cut it off at the feet. Our third disciple is, that's an icon, Greek icon, very famous one, is Peter's brother, Andrew. So what do we know about Andrew? Again, like Peter, he's a fisherman. The scriptures say from the town of Bethsaida. What, interesting about Andrew, he's the only one of the disciples who was claimed, according to the Gospel of John, to have been first a disciple of another man. Anybody want to take a gander? Let me go. I haven't done over here. I see a young lady in the second row. What's your name? Peggy. Yes, that's correct. He was a disciple of John the Baptist. And because you got that right, I have a Kit Kat bar for you, young lady. I'm sure that your husband will be breaking off a piece or two. All right, very good. Yes, Andrew was first a disciple of John the Baptist and converts over to become a disciple of Jesus. Interesting things in the Bible about Andrew, he's the one who tells Jesus that uh, even though there's no food to eat, there's a little boy that has some loaves and fishes, which means at a big gathering, Andrew knows who's brought the food, amen? Yeah, he was paying attention. What do we know about once the, the, the story of the Bible ends, what do we know about Andrew? Well, according to Eusebius, he travels as far as the Black Sea and preaches in a city that today we know as Kiev in the Ukraine. If you go look at a map, it'll be astounding how far this man went. To this day, because he landed as far uh, east as that, he is the patron saint of Russia, Ukraine, and Romania. Now, what's different about him, do we have another picture? He was crucified on an X cross. He would, be, he would be crucified in a city called Patras, which is in modern day Greece, in 71 AD. And because he was crucified on an X cross, an X cross to this day is called the cross of St. Andrew, okay? We have another picture. There is some famous sculpture by Michelangelo, and you can see the X cross behind St. Andrew. We have another picture. And there, if you go to churches today throughout Scotland, and why Scotland? What does Andrew have to do with Scotland? Because in 700 AD, they took his remains and they did a tour with his remains. This is during the Dark Ages and the Mid Middle Ages. And his, the tour of, of Andrew's bones uh, literally went as far west to the Great Britain, the UK, and went to Scotland. And legend has it when it was in Scotland that people who were sick, if they could gaze upon the bones, they got healed. People that were uh, having problems of some way or another, the minute the bones came through, was healing. And the most significant miracle today, a golf, one of the most famous golf courses on the world, I would say probably the most famous golf course on the world, was where his bones were literally interred for 100 years. Anybody want to take a gander at the name of that golf course? This isn't for candy. You could just, St. Andrews, amen. And, dang it. That's the, that's the one I would have gotten tonight, huh? And uh, so to this day, if you look at the flag of Scotland, it's a St. Andrews cross, okay? So any other pictures? And that is where he is buried in the city, the legendary burial site in Greece, in Patras. He's the patron saint of the Greek Orthodox Church. Our next disciple is this man. This is a famous painting by a Spanish master named El Greco, the Greek. Nobody knows much about this painter, but he did numerous series on the disciples. This is James, not the lesser. This is the son of Zebedee. Do we have another picture? And this is where his remains are today. What do we know about this, James? We don't have to leave the Bible because the Bible tells us what happened to him. He's a fisherman. He was there, one of the three, on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus was transfigured. He, though, the bad thing about him, when they had a little rough patch in Samaria, he wanted to call down fire and burn them all. Hmm. 
In Acts 12, though, he becomes significant because he becomes the first martyr of the Christian church. It says that Herod Agrippa had his body thrown down the steps of the temple in 44 AD in front of the others. And it says it pleased the Jews so much that he was gonna have Peter done next. If you wanna know the story, you can read it. But James would be the first one killed for being a believer in the Christian faith. In the year 670, a Spanish king named Alfonso II came to Jerusalem and purchased the traditional ossuary that housed his bones and took it to Seville, Spain, where today they built that church over the remains of St. James. Disciple number five, this man, Greek icon. You could see a scroll in his hand, which signifies he was a messenger. His name is Philip. Now, every time I looked at an icon of Philip, and there was numerous ones, me and Sonia looked at him, he had beautiful hair. He was like the Justin Bieber of the disciples. He just, <laughs> he had really nice hair, apparently. All right? The Bible, the Gospel of John says he was from Bethsaida as well. Interesting, his name means love, but it's not a Hebrew or an Aramaic name. It's a Greek name, Philip, Phileo. He's the only one of the disciples who had a Greek name name. Interesting, with that being said, he is the one who informs Andrew that the Greeks, there's certain Greeks that want to meet Jesus. Was he part of the team because he could understand and translate Greek? That's kind of a modern theory. Uh, history says once the Bible, after the Bible, that he went throughout all areas preaching with his sister named Miriam. However, in 80 AD, in Herapolis, Anatolia, part of the Roman Empire, which today is Turkey, he was crucified. A week ago on the news, I believe we have another picture. Yeah, see the good hair? He had nice hair. All right, next picture. This is in the two weeks ago in the news, you might have seen this. Italian archaeologists in modern day Turkey or Anatolia found this tomb. They know that. Philip was buried there because there's coins from the Byzantine Empire that showed a triangle building, and the inscription on the coin says the tomb of Philip. But nobody, they thought this building had been lost. My friends, two weeks ago, this gentleman right here found it. And when they finally went inside of it, it was news all over. The inscription on the inside said, here lies Philip. You can Google that when you get home if you want to know more about that. Our next one, ah, he's writing. This is a clue. This is St. Matthew. This will be the first, one of the gospel writers, right? History has another name for him in the gospels. Anybody wanna know what his, with a show of hands, what his other name is used? This is a candy question. Let's get rid of the candy. I see a hand, but I can't tell if it's a young, yes, young man, what's your name? Mike. Levi, very good. All right, so let's see here. You get some Twizzlers. Here you go, brother. Pan those back there, good job. Yes, one gospel says his name was Levi. The others say his name was Matteo, or Matthew in English, All right? I believe we have another picture, Greek icon. He's always in paintings with the book in his hand or writing. Again, if you did not have a Bible, this would be a great lesson that he's one of the gospel writers, amen? However, more is known about him in the Bible and then hardly anything, it's very sketchy, after the Bible ends. To the Coptic church, which are Egyptian Christians, which there's over 25 million of them in Egypt, he is their patron saint. Why? Because the only thing we know is he went to Africa. Legend has it, there's two major legends, and even first century or second century writers don't agree. One says he was stoned to death in Ethiopia and that his remains are there. Another source claims he was stabbed and killed in lower Egypt. There's no real tomb site or grave site of him. He's kind of lost. There's really no indication what years he lived to. But he gains prominence in Africa. In fact, many African 
Christians to this day only carry the Gospel of Matthew. And why? It's not a candy question because I think I'm out of candy, but why? What would, what would be the significance of the Gospel of Matthew if you're an African or, or Egyptian than, as opposed to the other Gospels? James? No? Something happens in their own homeland in the Gospel of Matthew that does not happen in any other of the Gospels. When Jesus is born, where does Joseph and Mary take him? Yes, sir. To Egypt. The Messiah comes out of Egypt, according to the Gospel of Matthew. And if Egypt obviously is a pull to Matthew once all hell's breaking loose and they have to leave Jerusalem, he travels back to Africa. More than likely, he was martyred either by piercing the heart with a lance or stoned to death, but nobody truly knows. Our next disciple. Hmm, anybody want to take a guess from that painting? A very famous Caravaggio painting here that hangs in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. And uh, you can yell out, who is this? Thomas, because you see him sticking his finger into the side of Jesus, right? Interesting, this man had another name in the Bible as well, or a term, not so much a name. Doubting Doubting Thomas would be one. He had another one as two. The twin, Didymus in Greek. So we know he is a twin. Was he fraternal? Was he identical? We don't know because we don't know who his twin was. But remember, twins in antiquity was, a, was like a blessing. It was, a, it was a, an anomaly. It was an occurrence, right? There's, there's sets of twins. You had Esau and Jacob in, in the Old Testament, but it's, it's very rare occurrence back then. But we do know that Thomas had a twin. Uh, Thomas only speaks in the Gospel of John. In no other gospel does he ever talk. But in the Gospel of John, he's kind of chatty, right? He talks quite a bit. What do we know about him? In 52 AD, do we have another picture? There he is, St. Thomas of India. Oh. Anybody in here of Indian descent tonight? Here we go, because nobody traveled more greater distance than this guy. In 52 AD, we know that Thomas lands in India. And for the next 21 years of his life, he would go around India performing miracles and preaching, okay? So much so that in his lifetime, legends hold, even Hindu legends, that over 17,000 people came to the Lord through his message, okay? To this day, there are certain sects of Indians that call themselves St. Thomas Christians or Nasranis, okay? To this day, throughout India, there's over 1,700 churches named after him. <clears throat> to this very day, there is over 70 million Christians in India, which is a staggering amount. Now, granted, when you think of 1.2 billion people, it's a small percentage. But 70 million Christians is way more than there are in Canada, way more than there are in France, England, right? A, a, a staggering amount. And when he got there, nobody had even heard of the name Jesus in their life. We have another picture. Thomas was martyred on this hill in modern-day Madras or Chennai. And this area of Chennai to this day is called St. Thomas Mount or Mound. We have any other pictures? Next picture, guys? Nope, I'm sorry. So he got all the way to India. Number eight is this gentleman. His name is Bartholomew. <clears throat> he has another name and another gospel as well. Anybody want to take a gander at that, but I'm out of candy? Nathaniel in the gospel of John, same individual. Interesting, this name Bartholomew means the son of Furos. Furos, you know a furrow, like a farmer with a plow? So it kind of implies what his daddy was, was a farmer. He never speaks in any of the Gospels, right? Silent Bart. He doesn't talk. What do we know about him after the Bible ends? He travels to Armenia. 
and to this and get so many people saved that Armenia in the by the end of the early part of the second century is the first Christian nation in earth. This would be 150 years before Rome and Constant and Constantine. Anybody in here of Armenian descent? In here? No Armenian? No Armenians here tonight? Well, to this day, he well, is still the patron saint of Armenia. And to this day, Armenia is 72% Christian. And nobody had ever heard the name Jesus before he landed there. Okay? Uh, you see the dagger in his hand? And next picture? Yeah, he, there's always a dagger in his hand. Now, it's not because he owned a cutlery store. Anybody want to take a gander on how he was killed? He was flayed alive. I think we have one more picture. Uh, Michelangelo's painting. And he was flayed that his skin was removed. You see the face on the... While you're still alive, they took a knife and peeled his skin literally off his body. Number nine. We're getting there, guys. That says St. Jude or underneath it, Thaddeus. Same individual. I believe we have another picture. Now, I pulled this one. This hangs in the National Gallery in New York City. And when I saw it, I thought, my God, when did Isaac Dominguez pose for this picture <laughs> of St. Jude? Isaac, who's over there in the white shirt. <laughs> Doesn't that look like Isaac? <laughs> so I had to pull this one out. Isaac, if you put, grow your hair out and grow that beard, dude, I'm telling you, that you got Thaddeus written all over you. Uh, he's mentioned by three early church fathers. All three agree that he followed a very strict diet, that he was only one of the 12 who was a vegetarian. Any vegans in the house? No, all right, we'll just all go to In-N-Out Burger when I'm done here in just a minute here. Um... He travels to Libya, North Africa. He preaches in Syria. But in 71 AD, one of the earlier ones, in Beirut, he meets his end. And to this day, there's this next picture. This is his gravesite. This is in modern-day Lebanon. In this, or it was Lebanon in his day as well, in not modern-day Beirut. Beirut's an ancient city. It was in Beirut. That's his grave. Uh, you can see the axe on the grave. Uh, anybody want to take a gander on uh, how he was killed? He was beheaded in 71 AD. Our 10th disciple, almost done here, is this man. History knows him as Simon. This is the second Simon. But they also call him the zealot in the Gospels. We have another picture. Uh, in the first picture, you might have saw a saw in his hand. In this picture... If you're sitting there thinking, oh, he was the patron saint of lumberjacks. No, no. Next picture. Here is his final resting place. And you can see it's not very well kept like the others. This is in modern day Iran. This is called the, the Grotto of the Seven Steps or the Red Steps or the Bloody Steps. What do we know about him? Well, the zealot would imply he was very political before he became a follower of Jesus. The zealots would be the ones who attacked Rome eventually. The zealots would be the ones who, the last 900 of them were on top of Masada. The zealots were the ones who prayed every day that God sends an avenger to kill these Romans. And a, only good Romans, a dead Roman. All right? And Jesus calls him into the mix. Okay? So we know he's political beforehand. In 68 AD, in Persia, modern-day Iran, Simon the Zealot would be sawn in half, and his blood would pour out on that site, and this is where you get the name, the Red Steps. Number 11, this is James the Less, James the son of Alphaeus, the second James that we mentioned. He's always portrayed in art, that's Peter Paul Rubens' famous painting of him, with a Fuller's Club, next picture. That's a Fuller's Club right there. That's an etching by Rembrandt. What is a Fuller's Club? It would be used to clean your clothes. If you hung up rugs, big garments, you banged them out to, when they're drying, right? But why is he being shown with one in his hand in every picture? Anybody want to take a gander how he died? 
He was beaten to death. In 66 AD, beaten to death by a fuller's club. He never talks in the Gospels. We know very little about him, but he would be killed in modern day Syria. Next and last, John the Beloved. All right. What do we know about John? John was the youngest of all the disciples. Most guesses are anywhere from 16 to 19 when he followed Jesus. He was a fisherman. He is the only other disciple who was a gospel writer besides Matthew. He would write three epistles, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and he would write the last book of the Bible, which is the book of Revelation, at the end of his life from the island of Patmos. I believe we have another picture. This is the icon of John. He's always portrayed as a young, young man. Okay, next. And this is the cave on the island of Patmos where John wrote the book of Revelation. Patmos is a beautiful island to this day, but in John's day, it was an Alcatraz. It was an exiled prison because ships only dropped you off. They never picked you up off of Patmos. They believe that early Christians, for, because of persecution, John was an old man, they, they hid John on the island of Patmos to keep him alive until Marcus Aurelius would die, the current emperor who was very hateful towards Christians. And John outlived that emperor, and they brought John back. I believe we have another picture. This is the monastery on Patmos that's dedicated to John. Next picture, that's the island of Patmos, okay? Been there a few times. And our last picture of the night, I believe, is his tomb. And on that inscription, on the bottom there, it says, under this little church is the remains of John, and that is in modern-day Ephesus. In, 101, in the year 101, John would be the only disciple who was not martyred. He would get to die of natural causes. It says at the end of his life, he cared for Jesus' mother, Mary, and he lived a fulfilling life, which fulfilled the prophecy of Jesus, right? Remember, Jesus rebukes Peter and even says, when you get to the end of your life, right, others will have to dress you, others will have to lead you. But it says, John, what, if it's, what is it to you that if he lives a long life, if he even lives long enough to see me coming back, what is it to you? And John would live, would be the only one to die of natural causes in Ephesus and Turkey. These are the 12 and in a short synopsis, maybe I hope, hopefully I inspired you in one way or another to maybe study out their lives. But if you look at where they died, some died close to home, Israel, James, Judas, obviously. Think of the continents that were touched by these men. Every Christian in Africa owes a little debt to Matthew. Peter would go all the way to Europe, to Rome. Few of them would die in modern-day Turkey or Asia Minor. Thomas would travel the greatest distance and would die in India. One would die in Egypt, another in Lebanon. If you go home and look at a map of the world and you were to put a little dot on all these spots where these disciples traveled to and died, it is amazing how far they came. But maybe it's not so amazing because Jesus commanded them to go into all the world and do to others what I did with you. Because before you were an apostle or an ascent one, you were one of my disciples. Go into all the world and what? Make disciples. And why did I wanna teach this tonight? You heard my father's prophecy on, those, on that announcement. Jesus started with 12, literally. But the 12 would become 70. The 70 would become 120 in the upper room. The 120 on that same day would become 3,000. By the end of the book of Acts, we know the church in Syria had approximately 10 to 15,000 believers. How, who was the pastor, we don't know. But it becomes the first megachurch in Antioch, not up here by Brentwood, in, in Syria. <laughs> right? By the time the last of the disciples died in the year 101, the last one who have talked to Jesus, traveled with Jesus, knew Jesus, that's John, most scholars believe there was 500 to 750,000 believers on the planet at that time. 
Today, there's over 1.5 billion people on this planet that claim Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. My friends, cities can be one. And I wonder what these 12 think when they hear that up there. I believe they're amen in it because they saw it with their own eyes. Today, every believer in India owes a little debt of gratitude towards Thomas. Every believer in Egypt, as much as they're being persecuted, owes a debt of gratitude. Until recently, Iran had over, I think, like 8 million Christians, but they've been so persecuted and ISIS and everything that they've left. But some of these date back to Bartholomew. Right? I, mean, I can go on and on and on. Wherever their foot touched, they had a message. And they made a difference that is still reverberating to this very day. Amen? Who wears an XL? I got an XL right here. Ken? Well, I love you, brother. There you go. Wear that proudly. So why don't we stand to our feet, class? And of course, I'll expect your papers due. Double-spaced with a number two pencil.